Our world is going through a crisis. Human relationships are relegated to the background. Life has become commercialized, almost need-based. But fortunately, there still are some people who hold on to their values, reaching out to others with only compassion in their hearts. They work tirelessly to bring hope to many. One such person is Dr. Topon Saikya. He believes in putting humankind and her needs in the forefront. Used to a high-pressure profession and the reality of being an oncologist, Dr. Saikya deals with terminal cases of cancer almost every day. He expresses his unique perception of this experience in a very different way. This philosophy was developed over the years. Now, what happens in life, you know, you plan something for tomorrow, day after, a lot of things one plans. And often things do not turn up that way. You plan and when things do not happen that way, you get upset. One should not have been. So one realizes that you do your job today as well as you could. And once you have done your day job very well, it takes care of tomorrow. So philosophy is that let me do my today's work as well as I could. So this will help me help others. So this is what I. Um, from patient's point of view, yes, kind of a branch that we are in, it's difficult. We don't know what might happen to patient tomorrow or any moment. But I can't be negative with patients. We have to be positive all the time. Whatever the outcome, a human life is here to be born, to suffer, to do works as much as you can and then go away someday. But I think whatever time we have in our hand, we need to live in a very, very positive way. And to do that, I have to be positive first. So to be positive, and I said, it, OK, let me live for the day. It's not that I'm going to die tomorrow. That's not the philosophy. Philosophy is let me do today's work very well. Presently attached to the Prince Ali Khan Hospital in Mumbai, Dr. Saikya is at the helm of various projects related to cancer research and development. In one sentence, it has been fantastic. Before I came here, I worked in Tata Mumbai Hospital for 23 long years. It was, I really enjoyed working in that hospital too. It was a purely cancer hospital. My colleagues were treating only oncology patients. Then you come to another hospital, a hospital like Prince Ali Khan Hospital. I've been familiar with the hospital for a number of years, more than 10 years. I used to work here as a part-time honorary earlier. It's a different environment, small hospital, community hospital, all kinds of patients are treated here. The Prince Ali Khan Hospital is committed to developing oncology as its forte. And with the availability of Dr. Tappan Saikya now as full-time at the Prince Ali Khan Hospital, we wish to further upgrade the oncology services mainly because Tappan Saikya is one of the most outstanding medical oncologists of this country and he's the best man for bone marrow transplant in this country. So our next immediate action is to see that we develop a full-fledged bone marrow transplant service. Was Dr. Saikya always interested in medicine or was he confused about selecting a profession like any other young man? Young people are all are confused, everyone. It's quite natural, you know, you don't know. You just keep seeing the whole world, new things coming up. Sometimes you feel good, sometimes not so good. So you don't know really. I mean, I want to be so many things. I suppose finally of my school, at that time, I think I decided to uh, take up medicine. Before that, uh, um, uh, very young, I thought I would become an engineer. Everybody wants to become an engineer because that's very, very, I think, <laughs> exciting area as a young man. You want to make something new. Oh, so I wanted to be a sportsman because I saw all my colleagues, teammates, they had a job as a sportsman. I thought I could. So, well, in the final year, I decided that I should pick up medicine because I got interested in biology. So that's, did medicine. Even in those days also, I didn't know what specialty I will pick up after I complete my graduation. Again, sports medicine was in the top of my list. I did some work also in the field, but somehow, you know, I thought that uh, being a clinician, I think there was a tremendous amount of motivation. So 
did my gel medicine after that. And after gel medicine, this opportunity came up to be an oncologist, getting a job in uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in Bombay. As soon as I got it, and I forgot everything else. I thought that there's so much more to learn before I can, you know, start doing my clinical practice. So, came over here to learn. Thought would go back there in Assam and settle down, uh, practice oncology. Things didn't work, didn't turn out that way. It's uh, because I tried. I tried a number of times to go back. Those who took my interview, they felt I was not good enough to join there. Well, it happens <laughs> for whatever reason. But anyway, uh, heart still remains in Assam. That body is here, continue to work as an oncologist. Born and brought up in remote Naharkatia in Upper Assam, he was virtually cut off from the rest of the world. But that did not clip his wings or his imagination. He wanted to reach out to the wider world outside. I often think about my childhood. I mean, uh, what kind of childhood I might have had. It's not possible to get the older memories back. But I think I had a good childhood, very good childhood. And uh, I don't think I ever felt restricted. It was a half town, half village kind of thing, the place, Nahakatea, where I was born and brought up. But I think we had everything. There were schools, there were colleges, there were cinema halls, there were theatres, there were music, games, pedophiles around, jungles around, everything. And then books, journals, magazines were my friends. And then when you were in touch with those, there was absolutely no time for negative thought. We were always busy doing something. Thinking back about home now from a distance, it's a kind of a mixed feeling for me. Because whenever I go back, I feel very good because coming back home, looking at the greeneries, and you see things, you know that you are in a different world. Um, then you feel good. And then, of course, the next feeling is that then you look at people, look at the houses, and especially you know, the medical college, you go back. You feel sad, definitely, so that things could have been better. What does Dr. Saikia feel about the inertia that has taken over people in the Northeast? In fact, it is a universal problem. It's more acute in our part of the country. I have faith in youth, especially the educated one. Education doesn't mean going to the schools or colleges alone. There are many ways you can be educated and cultured. Above everything, I feel self-help is the best help. That's when you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have faith in yourself that I can do this much. Everyone is born with a, some kind of talent. I feel that that needs to be exploited. And I think that exploitation might come from themselves. Casting a bird's eye view on the Northeast, Dr. Saikia feels. Mumbai, well, when I came in, it was Bombay. It grows on you, it grows on you very quickly. Uh, coming from a small place, it might be a little difficult for someone to, but it grows on you so quickly that, and you cultivate everything here. You, the way people talk, uh, the way people work, mainly the work culture. People, uh, they don't usually, even if they have complained, they don't show it that, okay, job is to be done, you do it. That's one thing perhaps is missing in many parts of the country, particularly in our place. I know we are pretty laid back there. Maybe we have enough to live quite comfortably for the day. I think that's one thing that I feel that um, we don't have there. There are a lot of resources in our place. I think those needs to be tapped in a proper way. I feel northeastern states need to be industrialized. This song has always been a huge inspiration for me since my childhood. You need something and nothing can give you better than a poetry or a song in your life. In addition to the songs of Dr. Bhupen Hazarika, I think the poems of Ambika Giri Rai Chaudhary, they really boils your blood. 
research and development in cancer is an ongoing process for which patients volunteer for trial medicines. How ethical is this? Clinical trials are on in India. It has increased recent times, mainly because you know, there are a number of drugs available now, needs to be investigated. Medicines that we have now are good, but they could be better. But if better medicines are manufactured, a manufacturer might feel that it's a good medicine. But at the same time, it has to go through some trials, very, very, very strong trials. So that first, there has to be laboratory trials to find out its efficacy, its safety, then it's come out there. You do trials may for uh, animal trials. It's very important to do it and find out that it is safe and effective. Then finally comes the human trials. So the human trials also cannot be tried straight away on some patients. There has to be to go through different phases of the trials. We call them phase one, two, three, four trials. And then when we begin the first trial, a new drug, we call it a phase one trial, just to know how safe the medicine is or how toxic the medicine is. Trials are important, but they should be designed in an ethical way. And even after it is passed through, and doctors and investigators need to remain very, very ethical. We are involved in some of the clinical trials, not only as the clinical trials of phase one, two, three, four, even some of the compassionate ground, some of the drugs approve themselves but may not be available freely in the country or they might be quite expensive. So what we call an availability on a compassionate ground. There are certain kinds of programs are on in the country and there are certain diseases people are getting these drugs and seems to be helping them. Quite early on in his career at Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, Dr. Topon Saikia got the opportunity of being in the team which conducted the first bone marrow transplant in India. 1983, early part, I was still a resident doctor at Tata Memorial Hospital. Our senior colleagues, Dr. Adwani and Dr. Gopal, they went to Seattle in the United States to learn the technology. They brought the technology back. And after that, once they came into the hospital, whole hospital geared up for it. There was a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement in the hospital. And they picked up a small child she was nine, nine and a half years old, suffering from acute leukemia, and her disease was under control at this moment of time, but there was a high chance for a relapse. So brother was found to be matched completely. So we found a patient, found a donor, and Dr. Adwani and Dr. Gopal taught us what to be done. And then uh, we did the procedure. And then uh, there was a lot of things, but because we learned many things ourselves, Dr. Adwani and Dr. Gopal, they guided, but many things as residents, we had to, I still remember the day after about 12 days of transplant, we were so excited to see the grafted cell under the microscope. I still remember the day in Dr. Adwani's room looking at the microscope, and perhaps it was a beginner's luck. It was a successful transplant. The girl is now grown up, 30 year old now, gainfully employed. So from there we took over. Dr. Tapan Sekia was one of the important member of this team who played a very important role in the success of the whole program. And as you know, since then he has been deeply involved with the bone marrow transplantation and uh, his knowledge about the transplant is uh, phenomenal. Of course, he is now the member of many international transplant uh, committees and we have also established uh, with Dr. Tapan Sekia, now the bone marrow transplant center at Jaslok Hospital also. Being a doctor, he faces many challenges. Every day is a battle. But when the battle is won, it is like a dream come true. This inspires him to conjure up dream projects of his own. The first case was, yes, starting, but uh, uh, maintaining the transplant program, develop it, and uh, make it of uh, international standard. That was a bit of hard work, but we all enjoyed doing that. Uh, at the beginning, you know, when you start looking at the case, start walking up, then start managing, kind of strong treatment they need to get, you don't know what might happen. But still, I think certain areas that I have been involved with in the last 25 years or so, some are very, very challenging, especially in the transplant area, 
when we are learning and there were some young patients undergoing transplants suddenly develop some kind of unwanted or unforeseen complications. They have been extremely difficult. For a couple of days, we'd be so worried about it, and then people do come out. So to pinpoint a single case is difficult, but as a group of cases, a group of diseases that we treat. Acute leukemias, when you treat, it's extremely difficult. There were some people I remember, they were young people, particularly I think the young people, you know, really, I think we get concerned. Some of them suffer from this kind of dreaded disease and going through supporting them have been quite challenging. And some of them have made it and they have made, ultimately they have made quite big. Some of them, they are scattered all over the world. I remember actually a boy, our second transplant, a case of aplastic anemia, there was a bone marrow failure. The boy had no bone marrow left, blood counts were almost nil, and we had to do transplant from his sister. We did it. He had a lot of difficult time after transplant, but six months down the line, he came out of it. Then he completed his studies. Then now he's very gainfully experienced. He's one of the uh, national newspapers. He's a uh, sports journalist, got married, he has kids now. So that's one thing I remember. There are some more also like that. Dream projects, there can be so many dreams in one's life. But in the field, yes, the first dream perhaps I would like to see a very good cancer hospital in the northeastern states. Whether I am involved in the project or not, I would like to see that all people from that area, all the northeastern states, they do not need to travel outside for treatment. That will be my dream that I feel that that's okay, the people of Assam or the other parts of the northern state can do something for themselves. Dr. Saikia is quite concerned about certain eating habits of people from the northeast. He feels that there are carcinogenic factors involved. Yeah, it looks like certain diseases are quite common. Cancers usually in certain parts of northeastern states in India. Betel nut seems to be one of the culprits because betel nut, you take with the betel leaf, lime, tobacco and other accessories put together, looks like a lethal combination and it's a kind of a chemical you continuously chew again and again for years together and hurting the inside of your oral cavity or throat or even the foot pile and if it's a continuous assault for a number of years and normal tissue in the body tries to react, tries to neutralize the chemical as much as possible, but as a time comes that it doesn't work and it starts dividing in a wrong way. And that leads to development of cancer. Treatment for cancer is extremely tedious and painful. But doctors are working towards simplifying the procedure. Dr. Saikia is very excited about the possibilities. Yes, I think we are, people, everyone is looking at uh, kind of a cure as a simple treatment for cancer, a magic bullet, what everyone is talking about. And then uh, we have been talking about for more than 30 years. And then someday, because we understand the disease better at some point of time and develop something very simple which will kill the cancer cells. Uh, to complete the discussion, many cancers in children it's already curable with a combined treatment. They require surgery, they require radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and with combined, the only thing is a very strong treatment. Someone would like to look at simpler treatment where you take few injections or few tablets would be. To give an example, there's a disease, the blood cancer, or chronic myeloid leukemia, a very tough disease to treat. You get the disease for a few years, you take some tablets, can control it, but it goes out of control very soon and you can't do anything about it. Well, a few years ago, about seven or eight years now, a new drug has been developed. People call it targeted drug because you know the exact target in the leukemia cell. Here, the abnormality has been detected and the scientists could detect a tar targeted drug against it. So, few capsules. In a day, you take it and the disease comes under complete control. So it remains, maybe at a very, very low level, what you call molecular level, this is still persistent, but it doesn't show up, a man or a woman lives a normal life. In spite of being in a demanding profession, Dr. Saikia finds time to read, listen to music, and be with his family. 
His reading habits are eclectic. Everyone needs to relax. I mean, not only doctors, everyone has to relax during the day at some point of time. Uh, doing other things other than medicine is getting increasingly difficult nowadays. Maybe in school and college days it was always sports. You know, let out your energy or whatever you have within you, you try to relax. Uh, currently it's mainly the books, read other books, not the book, medical books, uh, books, any kind of books. I used to be a bookworm actually in that I used to bunk my classes from college, read Leon Uris of all the authors. You know Leon Uris, that one who is a Jewish writer who wrote about uh, formation of Israel. That book was a huge inspiration for me. Um, other things, I think it's literature, I read all kinds of literature. It's, it's a bit a novel or a philosophy. I think something that I enjoy most reading travelogues. Travelogues teach you so many things. You enjoy Brian Bryson, you know, he has written lots of books, very, very funny books. The travelogues are beautiful, I love that. Listen to some music whenever time. I mean, like any other normal person would do, you know, try to relax as much as you can with your family, watching TV, something. Uh, regret, yes, I do have a regret because I, I wish I could sing, which I never could, <laughs> or play some kind of musical instrument. Uh, that was not possible. Uh, yes, the book uh, Old Man and the Sea, I read when I was very young, school, maybe I was somewhere between 10 and 12 years of age. Um, it hit me very hard uh, because it's a very small volume book, it's less than 100 pages. But in that book you have everything, all struggles in the life of a man. So I think the size of the book and it is in such a small size, so many things punched in there might have hit me very hard. And it still remains my, one of my most favorite books. Sometimes when I feel a little let down, I think about that book, that character, the old man, the fisherman. Now I try to draw some strength from that character in everyday life, and especially in my field, dealing with a terminal case or a very difficult case. It's difficult for everyone the patient, the family, ourselves, the whole medical team. But the life is for a struggle. But whatever do in our life should be meaningful. We should not be negative as much as you can. But it, it try to help the patient and the family to remain strong as much as possible. End will come someday, some way, this way or that way. But it's very important that until the last moment, whatever we do, a job, or a life, I mean, we go ahead and do it in such a way that at the end of it, says, okay, whatever the fight was, a kind of a well, well fought battle that we have had. So that's what I usually try to do. And at the end of it, move on to the next thing after that. But uh, not allowing negative thoughts to come into mind in anybody's. I try to do that. Sometimes we are successful, at times we are not. Who are the people who have most powerfully influenced his life and his dream? I think I'm a very impressionable man. Everybody influences me in my life. <laughs> in childhood, of course, my family, my grandmother, parents, even my siblings, neighborhood boys and girls, everyone. Teachers in school, looks like. I think it will be wrong to name one person or a few persons in my life feel that I have drawn strength from a lot of people. I think I was really impressionable. I continue with this. So, at, even at this moment of time, if I, I mean, any situation, you know, someone young or somebody, you know, I see something positive or what if negative, whatever, I usually imbibe it. That has been my uh, nature so far. So, to point somebody, but still if someone has to name some people, Yes, it's certainly my grandmother, maternal grandmother, who brought me up and uh, saw me through in my school days, then came to college. In college, you are on your own. Then you look up to your colleagues, your teachers. There were people. In the school also, there were teachers. At my graduation and post graduations my wife always has been strength, BT has tremendous strength. We have been together for how long now? More than 35 years. We have been together since days of 17 years can't imagine that. And she's not tired of me yet.
Like all people from the Northeast, Dr. Saikia has an interesting personality. He finds plenty of time for introspecting on his life and times. Now one tries to look back how much have we come, how much more to go. It's difficult, but I feel that if I had to live my dif life differently, would I live it? Perhaps yes. I think there are many things that you get wiser now. Maybe I would have done some different things in school or college or in my professional life. But I suppose still any whatever I had done, done it in a way, suppose, did not hurt too many people. I hope so. Might have. It's quite possible in anybody's life. Then this question came to my mind that everybody wants to be happy. I'm no exception. I certainly want to be happy. How do I get it? Then one starts looking at, well, some things can give you, some body can give you. Then you realize at some point of that, it's ultimately you have to be happy yourself. Somebody says somewhere that happiness comes from within. Boots are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep.